The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Edgar Rice Burroughs Martians denied entry at Bradbury University at Mons Olympus at twice the rate. His green Martians from old Bugs Bunny cartoons. Scantily clad Martian princesses and barrel-chested genius heroes are a bunch of boring stereotypes and can go flute themselves, says University Administrator Commander X2, before inadvertently disappearing into a portable hole laid by a cross-dressing, serial, sexually harassing, rascally wabbit species indeterminate. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time, Bain Consulting Editor David Afsharirad conducts an interview with a nice group of authors who have stories in the new Year's Best Military and Adventure SF, Volume 5. Hey, this is an anthology we put out for the last five years, and they've all been edited by the redoubtable David Afsharirad. Now, David reads widely in all the SF magazines and websites and culls the best of the best for these anthologies. I want to also remind you that you can vote for the best story in the anthology during this month, July, and into mid-August. The author who gets the most votes gets 500 extra bucks. We'll present that at DragonCon. David will give it to him at a special ceremony and a cool plaque. So support your favorite authors with a vote. Go and do that at our website. The details of how to do that are in the book. And what do you get out of it? Well, you get to read the book and support your own reading pleasure. Get a hold of that anthology forthwith. And anyway, that interview is upcoming. It's a good one. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. Give love to the June mass market paperbacks now out from Bain. Hey, when a mass market paperback edition comes out, this also means that the ebook price goes down, so it's a double barrel of value, folks. Bang, bang. Out now in mass market is 1637 The Volga Rules by Eric Flint, Paula Goodlett, and Gore Cuff. Inspired by the American uptimers, Russian serfs are rebelling. Meanwhile, Tsar Mikhail has escaped house arrest and is making his way by dirigible to the village of Ufa where he intends to set up a government in exile. The path is dangerous for the serfs as well as the czar, but it could be that a new wind of liberty is about to blow three centuries early and change Mother Russia forever. And out in June, in mass market paperback edition, is expiration date by the great Tim Powers. Ghosts can be caught and bottled and sold. When a young boy accidentally inhales the ghost of Thomas Edison, he finds that all the factions of Los Angeles's occult underground are after him, determined to kill him and get Edison's powerful ghost for themselves. Expiration Date by Tim Powers and 1637 The Volga Rules by Eric Flint, Paula Goodlett, and Gorg Huff are now in mass market paperback, and their respective ebook conditions are discounted at booksellers everywhere. Hey everybody, it's David Afsharirod here. It's been a while, but I'm back on the Bain Free Radio Hour, and I'm going to be talking about the new anthology out in paperback and ebook from Bain now. It's the Year's Best Military and Adventure Science Fiction Volume 5, and it is edited by yours truly. And it's great to be here, and I want to thank Tony Daniel for having me on uh, to talk about it. And we're going to be talking today with uh, four of the contributors from uh, the anthology. We would have liked to have everybody, but we don't have six or seven hours to spend, so we're going to make do with uh, with uh, these four as a representative sample, hopefully. Uh, I want to go ahead and introduce them. First up, we have James Beeman. He spent 12 years in the Air Force, 21 years married, and still counting, and a lifetime playing video games, all of which somehow finds its way into his fiction. He's been in Iraq, Afghanistan, and on the Nebula Awards recommended reading lists, and he figures all three are pretty respectable stamps on his passport. Uh, he recently published his first novel, Pendulum Heroes, and is actively working on releasing the follow-up when he's not busy updating this bio for things like this podcast. Uh, he lives and works in Virginia with his wife, son, and attack cat. James, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. 
Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. All right. Next up, uh, returning to the Bain Free Radio Hour is Brendan Dubois. He is the award-winning author of 22 novels and more than 170 short stories. He's currently working on a series of novels with uh, a guy you may have heard of named James Patterson. His short fiction has appeared in Playboy, Analog, Asimov's, FNSF, Ellery Queen, Alfred Hitchcock, and numerous anthologies, including Best American Mystery Stories of the Century and Best American Noir of the Century. Uh, he's the author of the Dark Victory series, published by Bain, and uh, his novel Resurrection Day won the Sideways Award for Best Alternative History Novel of the Year. Uh, his stories have thrice won him the Seamus Award from the Private Eye Writers of America and have also earned him three Mystery Writers of America Edgar Allan Poe Award nomination. He's also a Jeopardy game show champion, and I promise the questions won't be as hard for you today. Uh, Brendan, thanks for being on. David, thank you so very much. Uh, Jeopardy, yeah, I was sweating that one. So it's great to be here. I look forward to the discussion and seeing what my fellow contributors have to say. All right. And next up is William Ledbetter, Bill Ledbetter. Uh, you've heard him on the podcast before. Uh, he's a Nebula Award winning author. I think that happened since the last time we talked uh, officially on here, Bill, although I've seen you since. Uh, he is has more than 70 speculative fiction stories and nonfiction articles published in places such as Asimov, SNFS, blah, FNSF, Analog, Escape Pod, Bain.com, the Cephwa blog, and Ad Astra. He's been a space and technology geek since childhood and spent most of his non-writing career in the aerospace and defense industry. Uh, listeners who are also uh, aspiring writers or writers may know him as... Um, the administer of administrator administrator of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award contest for Bain and the National Space Society. Uh, he's also the science track coordinator for the FinCon convention up in the DFW area. His new novel Level Five is available from Audible Originals. Bill, thanks so much for being on the podcast again. Glad to be here. I'm, I'm always enjoy the podcast. Uh, you guys do great work. <laughs> All right, and finally we have Chris Porto. He is the best-selling author of the sci-fi thriller novels of the Syncorp Saga, which are uh, co-authored with David Bruns. Uh, if you like the character Stax Fisher, which is featured in the Irkin and Job, his story in this year's best anthology, uh, Stax shows up as a major character in the saga's second series, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later, hopefully. Um, a full-length Stack Fisher novel is uh, currently under contract and will be coming out soon, we hope. Uh, Chris's first novel, Shadows Burned In, earned the 2015 E-Lit Book Award Gold Medal for Literary Fiction. His book, The Lazarus Protocol, uh, which is the first novel in the Sin Corp Saga's first series, placed in the top ten in Reed Freely's 2018 50 Best Indie Books of the Year contest, and it was the highest-rated sci-fi novel in the contest. Uh, he lives just down the road from me in College Station with his wife, son, and their carnivorous zombie alert system, also known as his two dogs. Chris, thanks so much for being on. Hey, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Um, so, uh, before we get started, uh, I mentioned this is the fifth year that I've done this, and I've felt very lucky to uh, get to have a reason, an excuse, and get paid to read all these great science fiction stories that come out, and then hopefully get eyeballs on some really good ones. And uh, as I was rereading uh, your four stories before we before we talked, I, I was pretty proud of myself uh, and proud of you guys, obviously. I really think this was a, this was a great year for short science fiction stories. Um, I want to talk, I guess, first to um, Brendan, just because I see the sheet where I wrote the questions down. Um, this story, um, Love in the Time of Interstellar War, is set in your... Uh, the same world as your Bane series, the Dark Victory series, and uh, one, or yeah, and um, one thing I think at this point we'll just have to uh, say if it, if you don't know, sorry, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but basically what happens is aliens attack, and uh, the majority of the adult population is wiped out, and we have teenagers as the protagonists, and they're in the military, um, and. It was interesting to me with that in this story and in the series that it seems like a lot of times we see 
you know, Lord of the Flies, although they're a little younger, but even Logan's Run or something, a world of teenagers and how sort of the message is that it would be dystopian chaos terrible but here we have teenagers that um basically keep the same structures of the military structures in place obviously uh, the world has kind of fallen apart around them but um they're heroic um characters and i wondered where that came from where that idea of using this idea of a world of teenagers but sort of flipping it from what we normally see maybe came from sure dave that's a great question i think in researching the Dark Victory series, uh, which, yeah, as you said, noted that most of the adult population has been killed off, and it's up to the teenage population to continue fighting against the alien invaders. You know, I look back at, you know, the partisan battles in occupied Europe and in Russia, and, you know, the teenagers uh, stepped up, and they worked within the command structures of the time, whether it was partisans or lying about their ages to join the military. And I like to think that in time of chaos, if there's still some semblance of government, some sort of order, that they would, again, rise to the occasion. But it's true. In my short story, uh, there's a teenage boy who you know, actually is an invalid. He's got a false leg because he was wounded in an alien attack. But he's still a sergeant in the 2nd Infantry Brigade combat team. And he meets up with a Russian woman from the Imperial Navy, and together they're going to attempt to destroy uh, an alien base. And I call it love in the time of interstellar war because in their short time together, uh, they do develop an emotional attachment. Yeah, and um, sort of the thing that this hangs on this story is that uh, in addition to sort of killing off most of the adult population, these alien creepers uh, have pretty well destroyed most advanced technology were sort of maybe you can correct me i'm trying to think early 20th century late 19th century as far as what you know anything with the computer perfect thing right when the aliens invaded they dropped uh nuclear devices in the upper atmosphere basically frying out about 90 percent of the electronics via the emp pulse and after that they had stealth satellites in orbit that if anyone like for example started up a computer or try to get a transmission uh, station up and running, or even a radio station uh, would be zapped from orbit. So they did shoot us back to early uh, 20th century, late 19th century. There's uh, steam-powered cars, there's locomotives, there's telegraphs, um, there's sailing ships and steamships. It's like the aliens knocked us back technologically and are determined to keep us there. Yeah, and I was going to ask, you know, maybe where that idea sort of sprung from, because it's sort of the opposite of what most science fiction is, of course, which is extrapolating future technologies. And here we have a science fiction series that is uh, set in the future, but technology-wise set in the past. And um, I think I speak for a lot of people who think, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. No cell phones, you know, Um, but... I just wondered where that idea... <laughs> if, you need a, if you need an MRI to find out why you're having double vision or if you got a bad toothache, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess there's some, some downsides. Um, but no Twitter either. I don't know. Um, but I wonder where that came from, this idea of, of doing a, um, doing a uh, future science fiction story, but with old tech, essentially, and how that kind of worked together. Well, I think when I, when I started writing this series, I wanted to do a couple things. One is to set it from the point of view of teenagers. And by the way, I had this idea before the Hunger Games came along. Thank you very much. And also, um, instead of a novel where the alien invasion begins in Chapter 1, I have the alien invasion having taken place 10 years earlier. So you have this whole generation of teenagers growing up knowing nothing except the war, Or in the case of some of my characters, they have dim memories of, like, electric lights and movie theaters and cars and trains and aircraft. So I wanted to set a time where um, it's like a a, a promised past has been snatched from them. And part of the killing the aliens is to kill the aliens because they are trying to conquer us, but also to sort of free the shackles that, that will allow them to regain, you know, the distant, luxurious past that they have a taste of and a memory of. And I just thought that'd be fun to play with as the novels progressed. 
Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, this is sort of jumping away from that, and I'm trying to find the exact quote. I'll probably mess it up. But um, the two main characters are, are talking, the, the young man and woman, um, and uh, they're talking about, are you, they're doing this mission. I don't, this is a hard story to talk about by giving too much away, but, and, and they basically are asking, are you scared? And, and the, uh, the young man says, you know, yes, but, uh, he wanted to do something heroic. And the young woman replies, I just want to kill aliens. And I thought that was a great juxtaposition of their character. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, in terms of combat, you know, you might have someone like the the male narrator here who wants to do something heroic, and maybe he's speaking uh, heroic to sort of impress this beautiful blonde Russian girl, most beautiful woman he's ever seen, whom he falls for and quite quickly. Um, and also, and she'll come back and say, "Well, that's nice, you know, her- heroism and all that, but I just want to kill the damn bugs," um, because in, in a way, too, their backstories are they're both orphans and. Uh, there's sort of a quest and vengeance to go at it. And without, you know, getting too much out of it, spoiler-wise, you learn quickly on that um, basically they're engaged in a suicide mission. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're scared of that. And it's like their continued affection is sort of the the glue that keeps them together as they face the challenges of the mission. And, you know, can they do it? Will they do it? And will they succeed? And I wondered if you could just... Briefly, for people who maybe have read the series or are interested in reading it, just kind of where in the chronology and how this story... This is sort of a side story, right? It's not directly um, linked to the main action of the the trilogy, right? No, but I would say, uh, in the back of my mind as I wrote it, this short story would go along with the third and final book in uh, in the trilogy, Black Triumph. Um, because it's set around the t- same time frame. References made briefly to the main character in, in the trilogy, who's a Sergeant Randy Knox, 16-year-old sergeant in the U.S. Army, uh, stationed in New Hampshire. But yeah, it's set in that time frame and universe, the third book in the series, Black Triumph. Yeah, and we should say uh, that's out, uh, all three books are out in, uh, I believe, trade paperback. And I think the first two are in mass market, and the third one's coming out uh, maybe next year. I, I don't know. I'd have to look at Bane's calendar. Yeah. <laughs> but but they're all three out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so people can go check those out. And you've written a couple other stories, I know, for Bane that people can probably set in this world that people can look up on Bane.com, I think, um, if they get their Google, Google going. Um, Actually, or they could buy uh, the past edition of one of these years' best was in there. I don't remember which one now, but uh, we featured, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think it was last year. I think it was maybe volume three. So uh, just finally, Brendan, with you, I just want to talk about, because you're a very accomplished mystery writer, as we've heard, um, and I think we've maybe talked about this but before, but uh, you also were a lifelong science fiction fan and always wanted, and you're writing more and more science fiction these days, seems like. Uh, I see you popping up in analog in various places. And um, I just wonder if you could talk about, from a writer perspective, some of the different rewards and challenges maybe of writing science fiction versus writing a crime novel or a thriller, if indeed there are any. Maybe it's a very similar process for you. It's similar in that, for me, character counts. You know, you have to have uh, characters that people can relate to, can identify with, can sympathize with. I grew up reading science fiction in the 60s and 70s and 80s. I I just devoured it. And I tried breaking into the science fiction market with scores of short stories that were rejected. But I sort of accidentally showed a short story to the mystery magazine, Ellery Queen's mystery magazine, and started, you know, starting selling mystery stories and mystery novels. And a number of years ago, I just had that itch, and I was between novels. Let's let's try a science fiction novel. That was my first one, Dark Victory, which Bain picked up, and that sort of gave me the encouragement to start writing a science fiction. Though, and though I still love it, you know, in most thrillers and mystery stories, it's set in the now. And in science fiction, you go to sort of world build and make sure your technology is right and the science is right, which is added to another dimension. But for the 12-year-old boy that still lives in me 
that was thrilled to sell to Analog after 40 years of trying. Um, I do love coming back in the field, and people have been very welcoming. So there you go. Great. Great. Yeah, well, I've certainly enjoyed reading your stories when they pop up. Um, actually, since we're talking about mysteries and crime stories, let me hop over to uh, Chris Porto. His story is the Urkinen job in the year's best. And um, Stax Fisher is uh, the main character of that story. And uh, he is sort of a, he's not a private detective, but he's sort of in that mold of Philip Marlowe or Travis McGee or um, even references uh, Mickey, Mickey Spillane, Mike Hammer character. And um, I love these kind of stories. I love crime novels and mystery novels, particularly hard-boiled stuff from the mid-century. And I feel like obviously you do too, um, or you're faking it very well. Um, and I w- wonder, I see, um, you know, that's, that is such an enduring character. And I see, you still see it in, in the mystery field, him that kind of character in the mystery field. But you also see a lot of that, transposed into science fiction and i wondered if you could talk about just why you why you find that type of character so appealing and why you think there's been such staying power even in a field where that that archetype didn't really originate well so it's it you're real you're right it's sort of like um it's almost i was gonna say it's almost like a fish out of water story but that's not even close to being right Um, But it's taking a character that's really a throwback. I mean, it's a masculine character. It's very much um, almost a black and white character, but the but the black and white gets gray when the when the when the uh, when the plot thickens a bit, and and often the character has to make um, uh, different and difficult moral uh, decisions that aren't as black and white as their their speech. Sort of seems to make them out to be as a character, um, and I really like exploring the grays uh, of characters. Black hats and white hats really don't interest me very much, um, and so taking a character that's you know say from uh, the 1950s, let's say Humphrey Bogart kind of character, and throwing him two or three hundred years in the future. I mean, you see it in the Miller character in the Expanse series, and you see it in Deckard in uh, Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's 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 really interesting to see to take a character that's that's clearly from a different time or maybe has a different ethos about the character and you take him and you put him in a whole a whole different setting uh and I think what that really points up is that it doesn't matter whether it's a whether it's a telegraph or a telephone or a cell phone or an implant uh whatever the technology you have surrounding humans the, the human part is still the same and it, it's kind of a that character provides kind of an interesting catalyst uh, to be able to examine, you know, the, the human question, no matter what uh, uh, technology surrounds them. You know, kind of like Star Trek and, and, and Roddenberry's original intent with Star Trek. Um, you know, so uh, I, I really enjoy Stax Fisher particularly uh, is is a real wise cracking. He's not a he's not a detective. I totally get. That where you where you sort of categorize him that way, he's in fact an assassin um, for a right, uh, yeah. the, the 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 setting is for for the Sincorp novels and for this story just to, to just really a twenty five words or less kind of thing. Sure. You know, it's about one hundred fifty years in the 25. future. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah okay. Uh, number one, it's about a fifty uh, one hundred fifty years in the future. Our Earth has succumbed to uh, climate change chaos. The governments didn't really do much about it, so these corporations get together, and you have five major corporations that have formed what's called the Syndicate Corporation. It's a, 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 a five factions of corporations that have come together, and they basically rule the solar system. It's, it's basically taking the Godfather and putting it 150 years in the future uh, and taking it up. And uh, uh, Stax is a much more complicated Luca Brasi kind of figure. Uh, and so he's often sent out by the Godfather character. He's not called the Godfather, but his name is Tony Talk, to uh, take care of syndicate business. And uh, that's what's happening in the Erkanen job uh, when we meet him for the, in that story. Yeah, well, since you, uh, I was going to ask a little bit about to, for you to set it up, and now I, I don't have to, so that's good. Um, but I do want to ask you um, how this, because this is not the 
this may have been the first time you wrote about this character, but it's, it's not the last time. Ed, correct me if it wasn't the first. And uh, you were, we were emailing back and forth, and you said he, how this series and this world and this character came about kind of have an interesting roundabout origin story. I wonder if you could share with everyone. Sure, it's going to be a little bit confusing, but I'll, I'll try and keep it as simple as I can. Um, about three years ago, I wrote a, a novel called Optional Retirement Plan, and the, I, I was actually it, the character comes from um, sort of two sources coming to get crashing together. The first one is Bruce Springsteen's Murder Incorporated, which is a song about uh, sort of an over the hill assassin who's being pursued by. Uh, the the corp whatever corporation the organization that that employed him, and his, you know his 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 tools are out of date and he's running for his life kind of thing and you know he's kind of over the hill, so take that and then I had the idea after um, reading a book called Still Alice which is about um, Alzheimer's disease, I thought well what if you have an assassin who's used to doing the company's business all over the solar system. And he's been unknowingly running his mouth for six months because he has Alzheimer's. And he's called into the boss's office and told, you got three days to get your, your affairs in order. Uh, and uh, we're going to retire you to Planitia Prime on Mars, which is a home. You know, we're going to take care of you. You, we, you took care of us. We're going to take care of you. Uh, but Stax pretty quickly figures out that's not exactly what they have in mind. And so the novel is basically a chase across the solar system with him uh, outwitting um, younger assassins. Uh, there is no, absolutely no projection on my part, being over 50, uh, that uh, we, we're still relevant at this age, by the way. Um, but uh, anyway, I wrote this novel, and I thought it was really sp special. And I know every writer who ever writes anything thinks it's really special, but, and, and I know you don't really know me that well, but I'm pretty self-critical. And that the the character and the voice of the character I thought I thought was really unique, transporting this Humphrey Bogart character to the future, giving him Alzheimer's, uh, making the entire solar system chase after him, and seeing him deal with that. Um, and I, I really thought that character was interesting. And so I, I I shopped it around, and I didn't really get any interest, and I put it on the shelf. Uh, and uh, when uh, so I, I found it a, a, a science fiction subscription list called um, Sci-Fi Bridge with a couple of friends of mine, uh, and uh, we were putting together our first original anthology, and I thought, well, i got to write a story to go in the anthology, so I thought of a Stax Fisher short story, and that's where the Erkinen job came from, uh, set way before my the novel that called Optional Retirement Plan. Um, and then when David Bruns and I were thinking about writing a world together, I said, well, why don't we write this background, what happened on Earth to bring the syndicate corporation into being and how, how all that came about. Uh, and so the first series in the Syncorp saga uh, starts with the Lazarus Protocol. And those, that, that series, David Helm, he is an excellent, excellent uh, military political thriller writer in the, in the vein of Tom Clancy. Um, and so he sort of wrote the, the setup and how the corporation came together. Also a good sci-fi writer, so it dovetailed nicely. And then I picked up the baton and wrote my series. I'm, I'm on the I'm about halfway through writing the third book now called Empire Earth. The series is called Empire Earth. And this picks up the, the series 30 years after David's series. Uh, and Stax Fisher is a major character in that. And so if you're looking at the series as a whole and you're wondering where the short story fits in, it's about uh, five or six years before my series in the Syncorp saga, so it's a it sort of sort of bridges the two trilogies together. So it's a sequel and prequel, sort of in in a way. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Um, I just wonder what it's like uh, if you enjoy. I mean, obviously you enjoy it, but you know, building a world with somebody else and sharing in that uh, where you're not in complete control of everything. I think, you know, authors sometimes we're very, you know, we, we make up these worlds, at, you know, at least I do sometimes because you want to live in them. And then here comes someone playing in your sandbox. And, uh, you know, um, I was just wondering, you know, where you're not just collaborating with one other person, but you're sort of part of a, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the sci-fi bridge collective and what that's, if you could talk about that just, just briefly, 
uh, what that's like. Sure. I mean, well, it's it's fraught with with uh, ego, you know, clashes and and um, I wouldn't have done it that ways and things like that. But you know, it's it's writing with David and writing with any kind of collaborator is is like any other significant relationship. You know, you got to have patience. You got to have open communication. If you get too heated, you need to walk away and then come back and figure out, you know, work work your way through the problem. So I mean, it's, it it really is like any other kind of significant um, relationship. You just have to have uh, have to have patience and open communication. Well, that makes that makes sense. Um, let's uh, just quickly. I'm just got to keep an eye on the time here. Let me go to um, James. Uh, oh, did we lose somebody? Maybe. Well, how would we how would we know if we lost someone? They wouldn't be here to say yes. Um, okay, <laughs> we'll cut all that. <laughs> we'll cut as long as James is here, we're fine. Um, all right. Uh, okay, let me just because I got to edit this out. Uh, James, I wanted to talk about your story, um, and it features psychic powered steampunk military attack monkeys. I think that's probably a fair way to put it. When I say that, it sounds insane and it is but in a good way but when you read your story it does not feel insane it feels completely natural and uh, i wonder where in the world that idea came from and then how on earth you made that feel so organic and natural uh in your writing that i as a reader just kind of go like yeah sure that makes sense you know as i'm reading if you know how you did it maybe you don't know how you did it sometimes it just happens well, I, I mean, I, I like to say that there's nothing more natural in my mind than killer steampunk cy- cyborg attack monkeys. <laughs> um, but it, it really became a, a combination of two different things. Uh, one, I'm, I'm in Codex, and I love it. It's a writer's group um, for Neo Pros. And we had a contest, and a guy gave me a prompt for the writing contest to write a story about, and it was a children's book picture of a little, cute little monkey in a diaper. And I was like, well, he's he's not dangerous. Um, but at the same time, I kind of wanted to use the, the monkey motif and to also go back to a previous um, world I had imagined uh, about a steampunk Crimean War. And so I was like, okay, well, how about their Turkish attack monkeys? And it, it just kind of launched from there. Um, I think the important part was to, just to, you know, make them as monkey as possible, but as you know, much of the cyborg vampiric type of attack monkeys you can get. Um, and that's how it has, how it kind of happened. Yeah, that's, that's interesting the way you say it, sort of make them feel, uh, as real as you can while having them still do that, um, do what they do, which we should say. So basically, um, so it's a Crimean war setting and I'll have you talk about it more, but, um, the main character is this young, uh, boy Oz, who was, uh, kind of, conscripted uh into service uh and they're on these steamships and he helps tend to these attack monkeys and there's this organ grinder that will play music and then the monkeys will jump over or crawl over on like harpoon you know with tethers to the other ship and and attack um so that's just sort of the setup um and it was just so cool you know i just when i read it the first time i was like this is going in um because you you just don't see things like that. Um, and um, I'm looking at the wrong sheet. And um, one thing I thought you did really well, and maybe you can talk about from a writing standpoint, or again, maybe it's something you just do and who knows where it comes from, but I really love that you do this world building through the action. We like see this happen and we get just a little bit at a time to where we can follow what's happening and learning as we go. I don't think there's any info dumps, uh, you know, where you just set us down and tell us the story. And I wondered, was that something that was really hard to work out? Because that, that's a hard, hard thing to do for a lot of writers, uh, certainly. Well, um, with this story, and again, it, it kind of dawned off of an earlier story that's, um, that's called uh, Song of Passing Grief. Uh, I did a mountain of research, uh, and of course, I, I have a background in the military um, as a Turkish linguist, uh, so I was able to use that, And uh, but I did a mountain of research, but the thing is, is that I know that all the cool tidbits that I know I can't put in, so I, it's, a, it's a balance to just kind of find the things that I, I think are really cool enough to, to, to include, and then so the rest is kind of hint about. 
So it makes it feel like there's a much bigger world out there because, I mean, from a research perspective, it is. There's a whole lot of other stuff involved. But if I just tease a little bit of that, then it's like, okay, this is substantial enough to where it feels like there's a whole lot more going on in the background and you only get a little window. And I think that little, like, glimpse at this world is, is what really is uh, more compelling than just giving you all the stuff I gave of our research, even though part of me says, I took the time to learn it, and you should know it too. But I'm not going to do that, you know. So I keep all that to myself, and maybe another story will come from it from that. Yeah, um, that was something with the um, science fiction aspect or the science aspect or however you want to put it, which I think this story, I mean, I I think it was close enough to science fiction that I felt fine putting it in here because we don't really do fantasy stories so much. But um, and I think that you did a good job with there's a hint – of how this organ grinder, a monkey attack thing um, would actually work with maybe not a real world scientific basis, but certainly it's not straight up magic. And, but it's just enough. And I think that was really well handled where it gave me that reassurance that like, okay, this guy's thought this through rather than like, he just thought it would be funky to have monkeys in here. You know, um, is that something you, you, you did, you did work out or, or am I just reading into that? <laughs> No, no, I, I really like to blend science fiction and fantasy, the whole science fantasy mm. thing. Um, and because I, I feel even in the future, there'll be a place for magic, for that belief in our hearts. And so even though I can go back into, like, the Crimean era and, like, set it up to where the technology is much more advanced than it would be, um, there's still that feeling of, like, magic and old Constantinople that, you know, people adhere to and like, you know, these like rituals and practices that um, people swear work, even though there's no scientific basis for. Yeah. I wanted to ask about that uh, Caribbean war setting. And um, it is something I know very little about. I'll just confess to the world, I guess. And, but that was one thing that really appealed to me is I go, well, this is different Turkish versus Russian with the British involved. What is this? And I wondered how you came upon that um, that setting and that idea to set something there versus, uh, you know, something we've seen of, uh, you know, a more typical steampunk setting or uh, during that same, relatively that same era. Well, I get asked that a couple times or a few times. And, and the thing is, is that I really love steampunk, right? But I don't, I think, like, the Victorian England thing, it's just, I don't really vibe with it. Uh, It's it's cool in, like, you know, certain situations, but it it feels, like, uh, just oversaturated. And uh, being black from America, I didn't really, uh, you know, I I can't really, you know, look into, like, you know, the Civil War era and, and really, you know, feel that either because, you know, technology would, if it was more advanced, would be probably be used to oppress my people more. And so, I, I mean, so when I go back to the whole Turkish thing, like my, my Turkish uh, cultural studies and my background as a linguist and stuff, and I was researching, a, uh, I actually did research to, you know, place my steampunk stories. And I, I drew to that because, one, I saw the Korean War, that, okay, this is almost like a World War World War type of situation where there's so many different sides and so many different battles, and the uniforms are cool, so why not? And so I jumped over there, and it just felt good. And it, it, it felt really good to kind of incorporate the, the whole war technology into something that um, I think Americans by and large don't know uh, very familiar with. Because to be honest with you, I didn't know anything about the Korean War until I started researching for the stories. Yeah, <laughs> well, like I said, I, I am aside from this story, still kind of in the dark on it. Um, one last thing about the story. I liked um, Oz has these two, he's an orphan. He's a street urchin who kind of gets, like I said, swept up. He sort of has two surrogate father figures um, in this story, or I don't know, father figures, probably too nice a word for it. But, um, and now I'm spacing on their names, but in the organ grinder and in the, uh, the guy who does the prosthetics for the monkeys and also is down in the, the belly of the ship working on the engine and uh, they kind of, they have, they're very different roles and they treat him very differently. And I wondered um, if you could just talk about that a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. Um, uh, the galvanizer, that's the guy who plays around with the machine parts and stuff. Like 
that. Uh, he, you know, with the with the you know cyborg hand, he uh, he's he's more of a kindly spirit in, in that sense. Um, he he kind of he, he's he's more focused on the invention of stuff, but he sees um, the predicament that Oz is in, being conscripted and you know basically forced to take care of monkeys that he's uh, fearful of. Um, so ultimately, he he's looking at it like, oh well, I don't even know why you're here right now. But the organ grinder, he's like, well, I need help, and you're the guy, so I don't care what you say, just do what I say, and, and don't don't back talk me. He's, he's, and so between the two, uh, I think that it, it creates an interesting dynamic of um, like, I, I guess like two different fathers, and in, in that, in that sense, one being you know kindly and one being uh, brutal. Yeah, and we should say, um, before we move on to Bill's story, I don't think we mentioned the name of your story, which is uh, Song of Home, the... Let me start again. A Song of Home, the Organ Grinds. Um, so that one is... Uh, and that was originally in Lightspeed uh, magazine, which is always worth checking out uh, for uh, stuff you don't see a lot of other places. Um, let me uh, let me go over now, just uh, in closing here. Well, not quite closing, but... Uh, you know what I mean, to Bill Ledbetter uh, and uh, his story, which was originally in FNSF, which is also worth reading, um, and it's called Broken Wings, and uh, Bill, I have not read every Bill Ledbetter story, but I've read quite a few Bill Ledbetter stories, and they seem to be, to me, set in what I would call a pretty near future, maybe even very near future, 50, 100 years out, something like that. I think that's probably fair. And you also, um, we talked about, it, you're the administrator, you run the Jim Bain uh, Memorial Short Story Award Contest, which as part of the rules uh, have to be no more than about 100 years out. And I wonder, what is it about that that uh, range as far as into the future that appeals to you as far as a reader and as far as a writer that you kind of keep dipping back into that uh that well well i think um i think there's a lot of great uh stories to be had just in our solar system um you know it seems like science fiction you know just took this huge jump and 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 uh you know adding you know with, with galactic empires and warp engines and stuff like that and, and it's like well you can't really have a good science fiction story unless it's spanning, you know, hundreds of planets or at least taking place on another Earth-like planet in another star system. Well, I think that there's just, you know, tons of great stories that could be told just about our solar system in the next, you know, 50 to 100 years of our expansion throughout the solar system without having any kind of, you know, magic whiz-bang engines or anything like that to take us, uh, you know, to other stars, um, you know, and... So, you know, that's one of the reasons I really love the Expanse series, you know, especially was uh, that so much of it, you know, takes place right in our solar system. And um, But, yeah, most of what I write, and, of course, for the Jim Bain uh, Memorial Short Story Award, um, it you know, one of the co-sponsors is the National Space Society. And when we first set this up, they said, well, you know, we're really not interested in, the, you know, galactic empires. We're interested in what humans are going to do in space in the next 50 or 60 years. And it's like, well, that fits perfectly with, with my liking. So, Yeah. Um, I think maybe do you think it is that if something's set 50 years in the future, the science has to feel maybe plausible in a way that if it's set 5,000 years in the future, you can do what you want? Um, and not to say that that makes the world building easier, but it's a different challenge. Um, making things feel, um, you know, I might live to see that. And and also people can look back and be like, man, that guy was way off. Do you think that's one reason maybe people shy away from it? Or is it just that we've been raised on Star Wars and Star Trek and we want to see uh, these big, epic, galaxy-spanning stories? Or I guess I put it another way, talk about the challenges of writing something set that near in the future. Yeah, I think I've talked to other science fiction writers who seem to think that it's a little bit constrictive. It's like, well, you know, we know what the technology is probably going to be in the next fifty years, so it's it's hard to write something new and original and interesting and but, you know, those stories of, of humans colonizing, you know, Mars and the moon and 
and Titan and, and uh, the asteroid belt and things like that. I, I think that there's a lot of, of wonderful science fiction to be written about that, and, and I don't see nearly enough of it. Luckily, I get to read uh, quite a few stories every year for the, for the Baines contest, but uh, um, yeah. And so, yeah, and you're right. You know, a lot of my fiction falls into that range. Um, and I think one of you, – you mentioned that um, I think the research – you know, I do a lot of research as well, and I try to make, you know, the technology that I show in these, I try to make it right. Um, you know, and I, you know, I try to make it follow the laws of physics. And, you know, like, for example, my – my spaceships, when they speed up, they have to slow down again, things of that nature, where I run into that a lot during the contest. It's like these things accelerate constantly, and then they just stop when they get where they're going. And it's like, well, oh, physics doesn't work that way, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it can be constrictive. Um, it can be constrictive, but, you know, I kind of see that as a challenge because uh, I think that there's all these cool things that could happen to us in the next 50 years out in our own solar system. And, uh, and 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 it's an underserviced market, so I keep I keep playing there. Uh, I just wanted to chime in on that particular point. I mean, one of the things that focusing on the next fifty years lets you do um, is, is that's that's conceivable uh, from a human character standpoint, you know, for the reader, right? Because this could be their kid or their grandkid uh, living in the time that the story uh, details, right? So it's not well, this is what humanity might be like in a thousand years or five thousand years. It's it's like this is what this is what my my grand could my grandkid could live in the middle of. This is the adventure they could be having. And so I think that even though it's a little bit more challenging, uh, are we going to have internal combustion engines or not? You know those kinds of questions that you have to try to reasonably approximate an answer to. Um, I think it's I think it's more rewarding in the sense that it. it it makes a connection to the reader that larger stories like Star Wars or Star Trek may or may not be able to to make such a uh, close connection with. Yeah, uh, the, everything is still recognizable. I mean, you know, uh, the mm -hmm. names that you know people people's names, um, you know, the the fact that they're from Minnesota, you know, that kind of thing. You know, those are all still things that we can relate to. Where you know, a thousand right. years in the future. You know those kind of uh, you know the, those kind of things would probably have no meaning. So, mm -hmm. and and so in a way, you know, by being able to connect those realistic details, you know, and I know this is not exactly a, a revelatory statement, but the more grounded you can make the science fiction, the more realistic the fantasy becomes. And so I think that's one one other way to do it, particularly through the character. Yeah, and talking about uh, recognizable. Um touchstones, I guess, uh, is one of the things I liked about this story, Bill, was that uh, you incorporate, you have the, um, not the main character, but the, I guess the secondary main character. He's an asteroid miner, uh, and he sort of has an affection for old movies and music, and uh, you've got some Beatles references in here, and uh, a Star Wars reference, and uh, I just wondered... It, if there was any story behind that or you just thought it'd be fun to put in and how do you go about one of the things that's fascinating to me is seeing is thinking about what whose star is going to wane and whose is going to rise you know a lovecraft has never been pop as popular as he is now and you know i remember 15 years ago you couldn't hardly find any lovecraft uh new in a new bookstore um authors who were bestsellers when they first came out in the twenties that now no one reads and, you know, but Hammett and Chandler, um, are still perennially in print. And so what is that like? Is that a fun game for you to play or as a world builder to think what is going to be uh, around for people to, to people have still heard of these things in the future? Yeah, I think uh yeah, it is a lot of fun. Um and and yeah, I'm not I'm not you know, people who've read the story seem to think that I'm a huge Beatles fan and I, and I I do like Beatles music, but when I first started writing this, I had I had references of of all kinds of music and 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 movies and but I was worried some of the more, you know, obscure ones like, you know, from I don't know, from like Pink Floyd and Dire Straits and 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 you know, Led Zeppelin that people might have missed those, but it seems like it seems like the Beatles is just part, such a part of popular culture. 
um, you know, and, and you know, John, Paul, Ringo, Ringo, and George. It's like everybody knows almost everybody. Almost everybody knows who they are, and um, and everybody's heard of the Beatles and heard Beatles songs. So, just thought. So basically, what I ended up doing is I ended up uh, converting a lot of those other references to, you know, like Beatles references, or, or you know, in one case, you know, Star Wars references. You know, the things that that are more prevalent in society that almost everybody knows, whether they're big fans of that particular you know type of music or movie or not. So, you know, I think about this with uh, you know they recently did the Twilight Zone reboot and how even people who've never seen a minute of the Twilight Zone will say things like, man, it's like the Twilight Zone, you know, and how that's just seeped into, like, that's just a thing. And I think Star Wars and the Beatles are probably a pretty safe bet for things that will will endure at least for a little while. Um, the other thing I liked about this is, uh, and I like this about a lot of your stories, is it's very, like, touching and heartwarming. Um, and there's a romance sort of at... Um, maybe not at the center of this, but um, throughout this. And um, these are sort of like non-traditional types, uh, we might say, uh, to have featured as romantic leads in a story. And I wondered if you could talk about how that came about. Um, You know, I'm thinking like the old movie Marty, where, you know, you have Ernest Borgnine, you know, he's not like, he's not Cary Grant, you know, but he's in the the center of this romantic film and um, sort of seeing that same thing here. Yeah, I, um, you know, I actually started out, uh, the, you know, I, I, I've batted this story idea around it in my head for years, actually. And I, I have a kind of a rule where I won't let myself start writing a story until I figure, figure out the plot and how it's going to end. But so I've had this character and the idea of this, um, this asteroid miner in my, my head for a long time. And, and two of the things that were always there is that he was, he was, he was extremely overweight and, and it was, it was a kind of an artifact of his job. I mean, he's stuck, you know, no gravity. He's stuck in this little uh, cabin in this, in this, you know, this tiny mining ship. Um, And so all he does really on these long voyages by himself is, you know, he eats and listens to music and watches movies and, plays games and things of that nature. So, so he's in, he's extremely overweight, and and so he he very seldom kind of even wants to leave his ship. Well, I wanted him to have this long distance kind of relationship, you know, basically only over the radio um, with this with this person on on you know this traffic controller on Demos, and um, but I could never really get the story to gel up. You know, and it's like most of the conversations were all over the radio, and, and it's like, you know, and, and that that led to some interesting things, but it just didn't really have much of, you know, like an emotional impact or anything. And it wasn't until I took this, this you know, traffic controller, you know, the Marcy, the, the female character, and I switched the, PO, the primary POV to her that the thing really started to come alive. Um, and And I wanted both of these people to be broken kind of and, and, you know, kind of not very sure of themselves and, um, and, and not very confident in, in their, uh, you know, in their ability to, you know, to have relationships and friendships and things of that nature. So, um, so she ended up being, I didn't start out that way, but I, I think it worked much better when, when I made her also, um, you know, physically challenged, you know, she's paralyzed from the waist down and she's got this huge, ungainly, noisy, mechanical machine that she uses to walk around with. And and that's why she stays on Demos because the gravity is so low and, this, and, and she can use the cheap machines as opposed to the expensive machines. So, so anyway, once I established that, um, both of these characters kind of came alive at that point and I knew that I had to have them meet in person and it couldn't all just be over the radio and and you know next thing you know there's space pirates and and robots and chases in space and (laughs) yes ancient alien artifacts and yes yeah adventure and excitement um yes well, we could keep talking about all everyone's stories, but uh, it is looking like it's probably about time to wind this up. So um, I want to last thing I want to mention to everyone listening is that um, they should go out and buy the book. 
or stay home and buy the book over the internet, your choice. But also that uh, every year we do this, we do um, call it the Year's Best Military and Adventure Science Fiction Reader's Choice Award. And uh, this is um, readers' chance to kind of let us know what story they like the best. And uh, the ballot is the table of contents from the book, and you can go to uh, www.bain.com slash year's best award. And uh, you can vote for your favorite story from the anthology to win. And uh, the uh, the author will get a plaque and $500, so not too shabby. And I will be announcing that at Dragon Con, which is uh, over Labor Day weekend. So um, everyone who reads the book, go out and uh, and vote for the Reader's Choice Award and let us know. Let your voice be heard. Um, and I just want to say again, I'm sorry we couldn't have had everybody on. Uh, I really do think this was a great year, like I said, for short science fiction and uh, in the military and adventure veins. And uh, this, if I do say so myself, this book is chock full of great stuff. But I also want to thank the guests who we were able to have. Uh, William Ledbetter, uh, James Beeman, Chris Porto, and uh, Brendan Dubois. Uh, so, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, writing such great stories and for taking the time to talk with us on the Bain Free Radio Hour today. Well, thanks so much for Bye having us, there. David. Yeah, appreciate it. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Chapter 29 the others were up top in the dying sunlight, poling their huge cargo barge along against the swift current. It was tedious work, and Keita was impressed by the seemingly endless stamina of the castlers who lived upon the rivers. The men worked in tandem, singing a song with a rhythm that told each one when to push so that no distance was ever lost to the relentless water. Thera was sitting on a crate, sharpening one of her many knives, she hid the blade inside a sleeve when she heard Keita climb up the ladder. Those who dared to carry arms in defiance of the law became very proficient at concealing them. How goes it, Keeper? She must have noticed the spreading bruise on his throat. Not well, I take it. Keita sat next to her. He was troubled and trying not to show it. Some of us are more set in our ways than others. We've got ourselves a whole man who has spent his entire damnable life eliminating folks like the vermin, and he's supposed to be the meanest man ever turned out by an order of right-hard bastards. He can't be the one. This is stupid. Since Keita had assumed his office in the priesthood, he wasn't used to having people supposedly on his side scoff so openly, but he didn't mind. Doubt kept him from getting a big head. The voice made it sound like he is. I don't know what put him on it, but Ashok was already on the right path. He was already seeking the prophet. Why? How? Thera obviously didn't like that at all. What does that mean? To kill? No. To serve. She had an incredulous look on her face. I know, I thought the same thing. This has to be true. 
I have faith, and I have knives. So if he's not the one we're looking for, and you decide this is some Inquisition plot to get close to us, say the word. I'll wait until he's sleeping and cut his throat. A magic sword can't do much for him while he's asleep, and he won't be so indestructible with a gash from ear to ear. Thera may have slit more than her fair share of throats, but he doubted killing Ashok would be that easy, even coming at him while he was asleep. And the rebellion couldn't afford to lose her. We might not understand the wisdom of the gods, but this is all part of the Forgotten's plan. I'm sure Ashok is the one. Good. I didn't stick my lips on some bastard Furster's food hole for no reason. You better know what you're doing. I might not, but the gods always know what they're doing. Keep saying that, Keeper, and you might start believing it yourself. She was trying to goad him into another religious argument, but Keeter let it pass. On their long journey north, they'd had many philosophical debates, most of which had been brief, heated, and usually left him feeling annoyed, angry, or depressed. It was remarkable that Thera, who had personally been through so much, could believe in so little. Thera cleared her throat and spit over the side. My faith in the Forgotten isn't as strong as yours, but I'm sure it'll last until the rebellion runs out of notes to pay me. Her admitting to such base motivations just made Keita sad. I know my interpretation of the vision is correct, Thera. Just do as we planned. We're supposed to be here. We'll see. She rose and put her hood up. In the meantime, if our protector decides to start dispensing judgment, you're on your own and I'm swimming for shore. He might be able to fight, but he can't swim to save his life. Then she walked away. He's stubborn enough he might put rocks in his pocket and walk across the bottom to pursue you, he shouted after her. But she just gave him a profane gesture and continued walking. He sighed, then watched the passing river and the setting sun while listening to the laborers sing their rhythmic pace. Keita had been preparing for this moment for years, yet he was still plagued with doubt. The Forgotten had long ago taught what must be done, and now it was Keita's duty to prepare the way for the gods' triumphant return. He'd known this would be difficult. His new charge was a product of the callous governing caste. Ashok's cruel, distrusting nature shouldn't have come as a surprise to him. The two of them came from extremely different backgrounds, but they shared the same teacher. Sometimes I really wonder why you pick me for this, Ratul. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to David Afsharirad for a wonderful interview, as usual. And to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the broken off ends of rainbows that got stuck in mud, plus stars, comet, and virtual particles generated by sheer exuberance and wonder. For Chris Porto, William Ledbetter, James Beeman, and Brendan Dubois, Authors with Stories in the Year's Best Military and Adventure SF, Volume 5. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.